Uh, in the 60th um, edition of Organic Gardening that came out a few years ago, um, local food advocate Dr. Jane Gusau made this statement in reference to the origins of the organic movement. Uh, when we said organic, we meant local. We meant healthy. We meant being true to the ecologies of our regions. We meant uh, mutually respectful growers and eaters. We meant social justice and community. When I walked in today, one of my coworkers and friends to me said to me, Levi, people are gonna have a hard time taking you seriously as a farmer if you're wearing a tie. So I asked for the moment that you would suspend what you're perceiving about my um, wardrobe choices and actually pretend that I'm a farmer for the day. Um, what I'd like to do is unpack this idea of organic a little bit. It's this word that we're hearing that's proliferated the market, um, that's kind of really widely available, and yet it's hard to know what exactly does this word mean. Most of us are familiar with the fact that around the time of the American Revolution, nearly 90% of all individuals uh, in this country uh, lived in rural areas, with most of those individuals making part or all of their livelihood from agriculture. Fast forward to 2010, uh, and there's less than two million farmers in America, and less than half of those actually make their living farming. Um, it's such a small number that the Department of Labor and Economic Growth have labeled it statistically insignificant. Now, for most of us, we're probably eating on a regularly, a, a kind of a regular basis. So the fact that the number of growers is statistically insignificant um, is kind of disconcerting to me, maybe it is to you as well. So I wanna look back at maybe the last time that there was this wealth of agricultural knowledge um, in America. So in 1943, we're at war. There had been an agricultural surplus prior to the war, but then it came into the war and all of a sudden we're supplying uh, just uh, an enormous amount of foodstuffs to the troops and the allies. And so there was, um, kind of this pinch on the American food chain. So Eleanor Roosevelt, um, much to this may, much to the dismay of the USDA, uh, installed a, uh, what was called a victory garden at that time. They've also been called freedom gardens uh, in the lawn of the, of the White House. Uh, and the recommendation to the American population was, uh, if we grow our food, we're helping support the troops and we can win the peace by growing it. So there was lots of propaganda that was similar to this, encouraging Americans to, you know, set down whatever they were doing, go grab a spade, a shovel, a broad fork, uh, and start farming. Believe it or not, by 1945, out of the 35 million American homes in the country, 20 million households uh, had a, a garden of some type. And what's interesting is when we say the word garden or farm, um, or, or garden specifically in this context, it, we kind of think about it in a very small fashion. But in actuality, um, in an urban area, the recommended size was between 1,500 and 2,000 square feet. And in a rural area, the recommended size was a half an acre. So these were pretty sizable areas. Um, by 1945, it was producing about 40% of all the vegetables consumed in America. What's really interesting is in 1946, we won the war. Um, the policy was no longer promoted. Most people expected that now there would be a surplus of agricultural foodstuffs. And believe it or not, there was actually a food shortage and crisis in some areas of the country. Um, Tony had talked about in the last session about this emergence of American identity as consumers. Uh, and one scholar calls this uh, time in, in this time period the beginning of Americans taking up this identity of purchasers as citizens. It became our political duty to purchase and consume. That was the way we would fuel the economic engine um, of America and avoid what had happened during the Great Depression. So fast forward a couple years, um, and I tried to find the most incriminating and vilifying photo I was able to, and I think this one fits it pretty well. This is a gentleman by the name of Earl Butts. He was the Secretary of Agriculture for the USDA uh, in the early 1970s. And so after this loss of agricultural knowledge had occurred, and most individuals were no longer aware of how the food system and the food chain really worked, um, industrialization took over. Um, and so there was an industrial model of agriculture that now grew basically th three big commodity crops corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, and Earl Butts famously said, um, and I imagine him saying it you know, in this photo, uh, get big or get out. Um, the proclamation he was making to the American community, um, farmers specifically, was it was time to grow thousands and thousands of acres of these commodity crops. The time for ecologically diverse crops, the time for um, uh, specialized farming was gone, and now it was time to grow what was the most efficient thing to do. This is a picture of kind of American agriculture. As we drive the landscape, this is what most of, most of us see and most of us think of as agriculture. We talk about these things. Um, 
and this is, uh, you know, just a regular cornfield. Um, and so what we don't see, and what a couple of the other uh, speakers have talked about today, is how incredibly um, resource intensive this is. Uh, the vast majority of corn that's grown goes to feed animals at those concentrated or confined animal feeding operations um, that Graham Hill was just talking about in the last video. Um, this is, relies uh, significantly on um, external inputs, um, fertilizers, pesticides, um, mechanization based around petrol-based uh, chemicals and petroleum products. Um, and beyond that, there's not really a connection between the individuals to the land, to communities, to health. Um, so getting back to that definition that Dr. Gosal put forward, I don't know that this maybe captures or encapsulates um, what organic is. I think what's disconcerting is while this is um, traditional monocropping, mono just meaning one crop, this could very well be an organic farm. Um, mean, what it means is they could be using organic fertilizers, organic pesticides, maybe changing the practices a little bit differently, but it hardly gets at that definition that we were presented kind of in the beginning of what about thinking this in a very holistic way. So Wendell Berry, who was one of the fathers of organic farming and organic gardening, uh, proposed this in the 40s, um, and this is in his book, uh, From the Good Land. He says, an organic farm, properly speaking, is not one that uses certain methods and substances and avoids others. It is a farm whose structure is formed in imitation of the structure of a natural system that has the integrity, the independence, and the benign dependence of an organism. I like this idea of, instead of organic being a reactive practice, it's a proactive practice. It's thinking about something in the systems of context, of ecology, of community, of economy. So rather than, you know, I feel like for most part, and once again, I'm a novice at this, but when you ask people, what is organic agriculture? Um, most of the time, I feel like the response is, well, no pesticides and no fertilizers. That's about as far as our understanding goes, for most of us. Um, and I think this is really changing that up a lot. Uh, two of the founders of, um, of organic farming, J.I. Rodale and Sir Albert Howard, um, spoke in depth about the importance of organic farming being around feeding the soil, not the plant. So we utilize natural systems to feed the soil and develop a really strong base. The previous picture that I showed you of all the monocropping corn um, and Earl Butts before that is built around a different model of feeding the plant and not the soil. So instead of seeing nature um, in this model as an ally, we see her as an enemy. There's a gentleman by the name of Elliot Coleman who's a farmer at, on the East Coast, um, and he talks in great depth about this. And then this year he had a book um, called The Winter Harvest Handbook come out, and he uh, spoke about these two different schools, uh, deep organic and shallow organic. If you're familiar with the deep ecology movement, it's a similar bifurcation. Um, so with this shallow organic, perhaps it's that cornfield. It's buying organic from 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 miles away. I don't know that it's necessarily getting at the core of what Dr. Gusau was talking about. Um, and it's still utilizing a largely industrial model. See, I think sometimes there's a debate about should it be organic or should it be local? I think to capture what organic has to be, it has to be local. It has to be community-based. It has to be intensive. Um, the industrial model of agriculture uh, has just simply usurped the idea of organic. And so it's become kind of a dangerous term. And so I think when we use it, um, it's appropriate for us to use it in the context of thinking about this systemically. So I'd like for a minute to introduce you to the Grand Valley Community Garden. And you may be wondering, why are there leaves in that picture? Because when you want to take a picture, where's the best place to take it from? Climb a tree and then take it. So that's what we did, an I, meaning I. Um, so this is a picture of what we did. This is about a mile south of campus. Uh, this was started um, three years ago by a group of students that were actually in an ecological literacy class, had very little agricultural experience, and decided to start kind of toying with this idea of um, sustainable food systems, sustainable agriculture. What's really interesting is that when sometimes people say, oh, so you're interested in agriculture. Well, go talk to the farmer down the street or, you know, talk to someone that's close to the area. Well, the farmer that surrounds this area, the farmer across the street, and the farmer down the road one way and down the road the other way all grow corn. And so when talking about this type of ecologically diverse farming that utilizes a lot of different methods that are really complex that we're just beginning to understand, and by just beginning I mean um, those of us here at Grand Valley are just beginning to understand. It's complicated, um, and it takes a lot of resources and intelligence that doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. Um, David Orr, who's an environmentalist and a professor at Oberlin College, uh, in his book Earth and Mind, uh, brings, uh, frames this in a really fascinating way. 
He says, I think it's devastating that there is now the, such broad support for environmental initiatives in opinion polls and such a lack of knowledge of what an ecologically diverse farm looks like. For most of us, uh, and, and I'm speaking corporately, but we think things like, you know, uh, nitrogen runoff and eutrophication and global climate change and depletion of aquifers. We think all these things are bad things, and, and we're right. Um, but what's difficult is it's hard to actually have an intimate connection with those things unless we're truly experiencing them. So one of the kind of experiments that we're trying here is to actually get out of the classroom, get out of the office, get out of the gym, um, get out of the Capitol building, and try and literally get our hands dirty. Um, that's kind of the experiment of this thing. Uh, so that we can maybe take that segregation between those um, schools of, you know, those that are supporting uh, environmental initiatives and those that actually understand how to make this work and fuse them together and try and increase the level of ecological awareness. Um, Michael, in the, last sec in the last session, talked about, uh, you know, maybe Michigan doesn't have the potential to grow all the produce that Michigan would need. And part of that's true. But I would also say that, that part of that stems from an understanding of agriculture that's based around this monocropping method, this singular commodity method. Um, Michigan is second in the nation in the number of ecologically diverse crops. And so utilizing techniques like succession planting and season extension and root cellars, um, I would encourage everyone to truly step outside, plant a victory garden, plant a freedom garden, join a CSA, um, tear up their front lawn. We have 20 million acres of lawn in America. It's about the size of Indiana. What if we all tore up a part of it, all of it, um, tore up our lawn and our neighbor's lawn? Um, maybe then we could get a little bit closer to this idea of organic as uh, presented by Dr. Gusau. Thank you. <laughs>